Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Metabolism podcast, the bi-weekly meeting where we have in-depth discussions with thinkers, researchers, activists, policymakers, and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our cities and how to systemically reduce their environmental impact in a socially just and context-specific way. I'm your host, Aristide, from Metabolism of Cities, and on today's episode, we will talk about the circulation of flows among cities and their greater hinterlands. But this time, we will not only talk about flows of materials and energy, but also of capital, information, and skilled labors. We will underline how cities are at the epicenter of the global economy, how they have become new geographies of extractions by sometimes grabbing resources, grabbing land, distributing it through a global market, and leaving behind dead land and dead water. To talk about these topics, I have the honor and the absolute privilege to have Saskia Sassen, which is a professor, a Robert Lind professor of sociology at Columbia University. She has studied cities, immigration, and states in the world of world economy uh, with inequality, gendering, and digitization as three key variables throughout her work. And she has wrote many books. I've enjoyed the the global city uh, back in the day when I did uh, urban studies as a master's. Also, one of the latest ones, Expulsion. Uh, expulsions, brutality, and complexity in the global economy. I I, I want to s- uh, spend some more time on this. So I, I wish you all to enjoy this episode. Before we start, please spread the word and share this episode with other fellow urbanites um, if you enjoyed it. And now let's start. Um, thank you very much, Saskia, for um, coming to these ep- uh, to this podcast and and welcome. Could you please? Uh, briefly uh, present a bit your work and and who you are. Yes, well, it's a pleasure for me to have this opportunity, you know, to to discuss with you, to to address certain issues. I have long been interested in a whole variety of conditions, and but it's not an arbitrary variety. It is, in a way, elements that sort of depend a bit from each other, sometimes in very strong ways, like the quality of the water, whatever. You know, we just are dependent on, a city is dependent on a vast array of elements. So that is sort of what interests me a lot about cities, is how they actually succeed most of the time in bringing together all kinds of elements of enormous diversity. Um, and, and, and diversities of many different kinds, you know, the way one city builds uh, its, its, its railways, its bus systems, its parks, very different from how another one does it. So that type of stuff, you know, how cities have sort of found a way to produce a knowledge zone that is theirs. And we pick up and we get some elements and we overlook other elements, you know, it's that kind of a mix. And uh, it, so you started, if I understood correctly, from more of a political science and philosophy background before you you went into sociology and economics. Um, what what yeah. made you gain interest in this urban phenomenon or this, you know, this urbane or the, or, or the city? Yeah, well, first, it's a, because it's an open system. You know, many very fancy situations, which would, could, one could also study, are closed systems. You have to accept the rules of the game. A city is by definition a messy, open, it, nobody can fully control it, no matter what. <laughs> you know, so, so there is something interesting, something alive. And after all, cities, you know, cities have existed long before national states existed, long before so many that so many aspects that today are constitutive in our lives. Uh, But there in the city, the cities already had it, you know, millennia. I mean, let's remember that some of our cities are truly, truly old. So clear and and they have survived. of course, many cities have been reduced, many cities have been destroyed, many cities have 
fallen in the hands of of greedy people who have, et cetera, et cetera, all of that. Nothing is perfect, precisely because it is an open system, precisely because it needs to keep on adding. The city needs to keep on adding elements, recognizing emergent conditions, recognizing that new elements are in play, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that is really um, sort of what interests me. That, that with all its complexities, all its closures, all its exclusivities, et cetera, et cetera, in the end, it is an open system. You know, if you think of it as a whole, there might be parts that are very private, but, uh, but you know, so anyhow, that, that's a bit the, the reasoning. And I guess with that line of thinking, you can study cities for an eternity and still learn <laughs> many many new things i guess yeah yeah and they have lived they have had some of the cities have had such long lives eh? uh, certainly say in a place like italy or or uh, the mediterranean zone right where there was much movement and you know these are really interesting histories so so i'm wondering uh, just uh, um There are some cities in your life, I guess. Uh, you you have worked in New York for for many many years, but you also went to Poitiers for some years for yes. <laughs> for yes, your yes. studies. So I'm yeah. wondering, you know, how did a small medium city like Poitiers in the '60s and compared <laughs> to New York or Indiana, uh, uh, where where you also did your PhD? How did you? had some parallels between them did you when you were looking at cities was there something that you were uh, like a grid of reference where you started thinking about cities or how did the or was it later on when you start theorizing your work that you s set more structured examples of how to compare cities you know i think both both aspects were in play but there is something about a city that every city is a bit different And so very slowly and gradually, I began to notice this, that the differences of cities. And I was traveling quite a bit. Uh, you know, I grew up in the, I was born in the Netherlands, but then my family moved to Latin America. And then I did my own trips to various places. So, so you know, you begin to see that There are cities everywhere because without cities, most of us, whether they're big, rich, poor, small, doesn't matter, but they are a zone where we humans can find protection, not always perfect protection, but a protection of sorts, you know, we can survive and we can be protected. So when you, and, and let's remember that there was a time when there were wars all over, take Europe. Europe at that point had like 600 different dominant entities. I mean, we're talking an old epoch. And, you know, each one of those had its own base that it needed to construct and to live in, protect itself, etc. So, you know, when you begin to look at these long histories of cities, you realize, my God, they have been there so long before most of us who now live, you know, who are alive, uh, you know, we, we tend to take it for granted. We don't realize what it took in, in ancient times, you know, how the city was a site also for protecting yourself from many, many dangers. Uh, today, we don't, we don't think that way very much. I mean, we, the city can still be protected, but still it's very different from that, those older epochs. And um, so this, let's say, central place of a city existed for a very long time and then nations arrived more or less and kind of diluted it for a while. But in your work, you, you kind of pinpointed that in a, in a globalized world, cities are once again kind of the anchors or the, the nodes of this global economy, global production, consumption network. What, what yeah. were your findings there? 
Well, you 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 put that very very well. You know that not not all people when I uh, when I do an interview have understood it with the clarity that you just did. So that's very good. You know that the city was was it was many things. It was the refuge. It is where you could find food. It is where you could find help. It is where you could etc cetera, etc. Cetera. And and we tend to forget that. But so in, in their origins, they really played significant roles. They really mattered. Today, we tend to think of the city often, all that traffic, all the, the this, the that, you know. But even in that, in that overwhelmed situation of today's major cities, uh, there still is a, there is a function there. There's a function that no city can do without. And it's a function that enables the circulation of water, the circulation of people, the circulation of cars, you know, and, and um, so you have to stand back and respect this, you know, and say, yes, you know, they, they, they really do. It is not just us humans who, in, who inhabit the city. It is also the city itself and how it was built that is an enabling condition. Uh, you know, and, and it's partial, it's not perfect, it's always partial. So that is a bit the, the thinking, you know, sort of what I think about this. And so I guess back in the day when you did your, your the, the research about global cities and the global cities function that were of course not the same for, for every city, um, this was a bit kind of going against the grain or at least Back in the day, if I understand correctly, there was much a, a bigger uh, emphasis on on nations rather than cities, and they kind of exactly yeah yeah, is, yeah you said it exactly exactly and so that sort of I I mean you know I'm a traveler I know that there is an international system that all these other elements uh, are in play also, but at the same time I I found that there was something about the city that intrigued me. And it basically at some point, you know, when it all started had to do with the fact that big business actors, big, big uh, businesses, big firms, the point to which these firms tended to meet a city because they were so big often, so rich, they could have gone anywhere. Why deal with the hassle of what a city also entails? Why did they have to be in a city, you know? <laughs> so out of that then came a whole variety of observations that I made. It was not that I was a fanatic about cities, you know? <laughs> I was just saying that, that there was something in play here that people hadn't quite picked up on, you know? There, was, there were contradictions, is one way of putting it. A city really contains a whole set of contradictions. And most of them turn out to be necessary contradictions. In other words, there's no perfect closure. There is no perfect ultimate definition of what ought to be done. Everything is a bit open and a bit closed. <laughs> you know, and that can help and that can also be a challenge, you know, that you don't really know how you are uh, going into that. Yeah, of course, it's it's quite challenging whenever someone needs to define what the city is, and how, because that entails how to study it, and that entails, you know, what is a good city, what is a bad city, or how to plan a new city. Uh, but I guess we'll we'll get back to that. Um, um, so yeah. you, you mentioned a lot in in this global economy that the role of intermediation uh, yeah. with lawyers, financiers, translation, etc., right. etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, But, But also, I also like to add yeah. the cleaners and the ones who clean the, you know, etc. I mean, it's a whole world onto its own. And some of it is visible during the day and some of it is never visible during the day, but only at night. And some of it is never visible because it's below ground, you know. I mean, when you think about what it all takes to have a city functioning, more or less, I mean, it's never going to be perfect. You stand back and you say, wow, we did that. <laughs> we humans, that did not fall from the sky. You know, we did it. And, and uh, yeah, and, and I mean, some people detest cities. Yeah? But most people, they, they need cities and they find that there is something, you know, that, that they wouldn't want to miss. Uh, nobody is perfectly in love with the city. Yeah. <laughs> There are too many issues 
the garbage that wasn't collected, you know, you name it. I mean, it's a very long list. And, and uh, you know, some cities do it better than others, etc. But But there we are. We really need, we need those spaces. And indeed, at least for at least my field is more uh, studying cities and their environmental impact, but it's great ah. to see that it's it's the locus where you have the global and the local meet. So you have to somehow negotiate at the same time, as you said, the garbage here, but at the same time, the extraction mine somewhere in Congo because of our, I don't know, right. uh, consumption of a, of, a, of a phone or of a... Uh, yeah. So it, it's this very... Uh, very interesting interconnection of, of, of challenges uh, that you, you somehow need to solve at the same time. But, yeah. you know, the administration is not the same, of course, here and there. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. really, really. When you think about how, how a city can actually more or less function, most cities function. They are imperfect, but they function. And that is also impressive in its own terms, you know. <laughs> That I mean, some cities are some cities are truly hard work. Let's <laughs> remember that you know that the endless traffic, like Latin America, has quite a few cities that are really hard work uh, because you are forever delayed on everything. You know, but but uh, one hopes that that and one one issue for me that has emerged as very important is that we need to build more cities. We, we should not keep expanding, expanding our already very big cities, because that is only to the advantage of, of the better, the higher levels of income. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but the poor, the poorer workers then have very, very long trips. Those trips can be two hours to get to your job every morning that you have to work. I mean, that to me is, is a marker of deep injustice that is absolutely not desirable, that we should absolutely eliminate. So, so the, from the perspective of the powerful actors who function in the center of the city, uh, they, they, as long as there are more people coming whom they can in, uh, uh, hire, etc., to do their work, they're fine. But those people are not fine. They have to get up at 4 a.m. you know, of the morning every morning and, and that kind of in that, that is a kind of injustice that is invisible to most of us but it's a profound injustice that we have allowed our cities to just grow 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 and where the poorer classes are the sufferers they pay the price for these very long trips you have to get up you know two hours earlier than etc to me that is a major issue every time i say in a, in a whole variety of countries we need to build new cities rather than keeping the expanding, expanding, expanding. People look at me it's like I'm crazy because in their image, uh, the answer is we have built our cities. And what is invisible are the poorer classes that have to take these long trips. They are invisible to our eyes. They are invisible to the employers. You know, and they have to. So, so it is. It is sort of to me very interesting the resistance of the notion we build new cities. The building of new cities is not just new cities. It's about generating a juster uh, option for life, especially for the poorer classes. To me, that is what guides me to say we should not keep expanding, expanding our existing cities because the, the ones who suffer are the poorer classes, we need to build new cities and stop this endless expansion. I mean, there are some of the cities in Latin America that are monsters. They're monsters for, for the workers, you know? Every morning, these people have to travel for two hours and they have to hope that the, that the bad bus is not going to, you know, suddenly have a breakdown. And I mean, it, it's just, it's so unfair when you think of our rich cities, our, you know, we have many rich countries nowadays. Um, we can do better than what we have done. And how do you see, so, because cities are of course also the, the place where 
activism takes place, a lot of political new idea, new political ideas can take place. Do, yeah. do you think that the implementation of more new cities will perhaps enable more laboratories for for changing the the way that uh, circulation of flow is is happening today? Would that be an enabler in your sense? Well, that that certainly would, but it's also just the notion of having a very, I'm really thinking in very simple terms here, when I say a reasonably sized city, you know, so that yes, you sit in the bus for an hour, but that's the maximum rather than three hours, mm -hmm. you know, if you have to wait and et cetera, because there are not enough buses, you know, something we need a, there is a, like a little list of elements that should be in play in all major cities, certainly in all of these big cities that are mostly not in play. And, and what is not in play is that which enables the, the lower income people who also live in those cities to have a more reasonable life in those cities, that they don't have to get up two hours earlier, that the mother who has children does not get home until you know a very late time. It, it's it, there, and, and these these are people who never sleep enough. <laughs> and I don't know if you have spent a, a week not sleeping enough. You know how you feel. Well, for them, it's lifelong. Yeah. You know, just taking these simple things. And, and how little it would really take, instead of keeping expanding, expanding our cities, to just build some new cities. I mean, it's not going to be very easy and it will take time. And again, I must say, mostly when I say this, people look at me like I'm crazy, which is fine with me. Yeah, it, it's, um, so it's a difficult question. It's a tough question indeed, because of course, more, uh, more cities equals more materials and all of that, but indeed, the 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 pace or at least in as you say the in 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 poorer countries at least big cities also mean slums also mean a numerous yeah. informal economies that's so, right that's right yeah. so yeah the, the scale the the scale of a city the function of a city is something elusive to me and i, I haven't figured out what is well whether there is and probably there's not a, a good answer to to that but there are certain like europe has done quite well there are some major cities like you know uh in france and in some of these countries huge cities but but which where you have a lot of traffic but they are of course mostly also have good traffic i mean they have good uh, you know good instruments for the traffic um so so yes we have some cities that are really huge you know that are but in Europe, most cities are actually pretty reasonably sized. You know, they are not, they, they are big, but, but they are not extreme. They are not like what I see in Latin America. Yeah, indeed. I mean, the, the population in, within, let's say, Lagos or um, Luanda or some, uh, some other uh, cities, be it in, in Asia, be it in Africa or being in Latin America, surpass the the understanding that uh, we can have i mean there is still london and paris uh in europe that are 10 million plus uh, but uh or at least they're metropolises but indeed imagine a city of 20 30 million inhabitants it, it's a uh, it, it hits a bit with vertigo the, the and and when you have when you have very low quality transport which produces a lot of very negative gases, et cetera. In other words, those, those drivers also in the long run, they get ill from every day, you know, doing the, the traveling. So, so it, it is unfair to uh, really a rather large sector of our populations. It's unfair that they should be traveling so much. And the ones that suffer the most, I do think are usually the poorer classes who live at the edges of those cities, you know, and and so it's a double negative for me that that uh, that is problematic. Yeah, you you have a, a lot of uh, from what I understand in, in your work, you not only look at cities but also how you know global economic systems uh, yeah. are affected by and are driven uh, by cities, uh, so are inf impacted by cities, but also cities are the ones that uh, that are transforming them. And 
it, I don't remember, I think it was one in one of your books, you mentioned that we kind of have steered towards a new type of capitalism that is not anymore imperialism uh, because we, we don't, it's not as in the past where there was a civilizational, even if there was colonization of that, there was an objective perhaps of civilization. Now, I'm not uh, at all, uh, uh, you know, saying that it was a good thing, but today it's much more aggressive or brutal than what it was. Uh, th there is I no reason it, behind it. Yeah, I think in many, in many ways it is certainly, you know, I grew up in Latin America. Latin America, as I already said, is a particularly brutal continent. You know, it started by being brutalized by the Europeans who came and whatever the others who came and, you know, and, and, uh, and it just is really, whereas if you look at, for instance, most of the, 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 the towns in Europe and the city, you have a lot of smaller cities, which are very important items. And, and, the, and, and the, they, they are not allowed to expand, 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 like they are in the Americas or in Africa, you know, where, oh yeah, whatever, anything goes, you know. So, so there really are differences, I would say, in our world. And these differences are sufficiently known by now that people can understand that there are some cities that do it well and other cities that really don't care about the people. They may care about a particular little group, an elite or whatever, and they are very careful with them, but, but the rest is left out. So, so the, the notion that cities also contain within them different types of injustice, uh, different, uh, the, the willingness to recognize injustice and the notion that hell, what the hell, I am not going to worry about. Those are poor people. They are lucky that they are where they are. You know, so, so you, have, you have a multiplicity of reactions. When, when you stand back and you look at it, it really comes down often to rather at one extreme, extremely brutal way of understanding, of saying what we need, what we don't need. I'll let them just, you know, if they, they are happy to have those jobs, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, those are a lot of negatives. On the other hand, cities also are spaces where those without power get to make a history, get to make a home for themselves, get a chance to innovate, you know? So, so there, there are these ambiguities, but it's certainly, there certainly are these are systems, urban systems that, that can be pretty impressive on both the negative end and the positive end, you know? It, it, and, and so the, the, what I really respect is people who live in cities, people, people who like being in cities. They are not naive. They know that there is a lot of injustice and some of them then also try to change that a bit. Most of them are too busy, et cetera, you know, but, but there are, for me, the, the city is also an opportunity for the better off, you know, those of us who have good lives and good this, to also notice more clearly those whom we often depend to, who are workers we depend on, they become visible to us. If we want to, we see them. If we don't want to see them, well, that, that also happens. You know, but the, so there is something, there is a legibility that the urban condition gives us, which is not present in many documents that we might sign, in many arrangements that we might make, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like a, it's a strange mix of options that the city presents. But it, one item that it does make visible is how the most beautiful building, the most beautiful uh, set of trees in a park can be brutal like hell because other elements are, because there's so many other actors. It's not just the this and the that, the trees and the people. No, there's the trees, the people, and in between, <laughs> you have everything. And, and you know, and, People learn, I, I think people who live in big cities, they actually learn stuff that people who live in, in modest little, 
they never get to know those, the negative, you know, the, the, the problematic aspects, the horrifying aspects, the, what you find, what one might find terrifying, you know, in a city also, I'm thinking of young women and who get abused and, and I mean, it, it, they are extraordinary combinations of elements. You know, it really... <laughs> these contradictions that you mentioned, yeah, these yeah, endless I'm contradictions. Yeah. And, and yeah, I think you, you're right because there's, I mean, you, you also have some work on uh, um, refugees and migrants and how this occurs to cities, but also how activism occurs to cities, how uh, yeah. many of the struggles, uh, intersectionality struggles happen within cities. Hopefully that would lead to, to, to something different. Uh, but there is also the cities are the, now the, the epicenter of finance. Uh, and yeah. back in the day, we were talking about the spatial fix with David Harvey and how, you know, putting money into buildings, uh, kind of put, uh, or invested money in, in the city and the city became an actor in itself of finance. And I don't know what your, your take is on the city as a, well, a very uh, engaged actor somehow without its will, sometimes a city is already uh, uh, the yeah. culprit of many things due to financial elements. Exactly. I mean, there is no doubt that in our major cities, and the cities do not necessarily have to be very big. Think of Switzerland, some of its mm. cities, very enormous concentrations of wealth in a rather modest little <laughs> city. Um, but, but yeah, what you have is, is, a, is a development of a whole variety of instruments that were major enablers for those who wanted to accumulate wealth. You know, so uh, the big cities, as opposed to towns, because in towns you would not have those systems, the big cities drew, also attracted a lot of people who wanted to make money. And that had some good effects because it also meant building housing, cleaning the streets and all of that. But of course it also had a negative because it meant that there was a project of grabbing. And that would mean that the weaker elements in a city could be, you know, removed with great ease, you know, pushed to the edges, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the, the city is also an open system. And in that sense, there are positives and there are negatives. And both of them are not necessarily, each one of these are not necessarily easy to change because they are embedded in certain conditionalities. The stuff doesn't fall from the sky. The stuff emerges from the ground level, so to speak, in a sense of what is it that we need? What is it that, you know, that we must have? What is it that we have to eliminate? So, so you know, you can't just simply change a city. You can change a bit, you can clean it up, but changing a whole city, forget it. So if you hit a city that already is like some of the Latin American cities that already have just you know, massive transport issues and problems, etc. You are you are stuck with some very bad air quality, and probably it's going to affect your lungs. And I don't know at all. You know, whereas other cities, like European cities, they are almost perfect. You might say, you know, everything is clean and okay, and. You know, many people use bicycles rather than cars. You don't have trucks and buses that it, you know, it put all the poison out there. So it varies enormously. But a functioning city like the European cities are a very good example, of course. It really, you, you stand back and you respect it. You say, you know what, of course it's imperfect, but it really is good. For instance, also that the Dutch allow the bikes, you know, in the city. The bicycles, you know that story, right? And stuff like that, which just enables people. Instead of taking a, a bus, they, they, they use the bike, which is better for everybody involved, you know? Uh, so, so I think that some parts of the world have just been more intelligent and less grabbing. The Americas are one of the most violent continents 
in the world. I mean, they are. The Americas are brutal. The Americas emerge as what they were by all kinds of actors who went to the Americas to extract, not to build, not to invent, not to make, to extract. That was the main project. I mean, eventually it expands, of course, you know, because you need people, you need houses, you need etc. But let's not forget how it started. In Europe, the cities emerge as zones that protect people. Because, you know, way, way, way back, I mean, centuries, the cities in Europe were cities that were there to protect the residents, the people. That is very different from Latin America, you know, where it's the opposite. It was not about helping people. It was about extracting value and, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so it's quite interesting for me and it's important, it seems to me to recognize the differences in how cities emerge, how cities function, you know, in a whole variety of situations. And the continent, I mean, I must say, the Japanese have done it much better than the Americans. Uh, the Europeans have done it much better than the Americans, you know. Uh, eh, yeah. The Americas were, emerged in our history as a zone for extraction, you know. Whereas many other places emerged as zones of protection, that you were afraid of certain enemies and you had to work together to protect yourself from those enemies. So those histories already mark a difference, you know. I mean, I, I'm exaggerating a bit because clearly right now everything is sort of more or less, you know, <laughs> a tissue, connective tissue. But when you think of origins, you know, there, there you begin to understand a difference. And of course, I mean, cities, uh, European cities have externalized all of their bad stuff exactly. <laughs> somewhere else through yeah, extraction and pollution. Past. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. To these very cities that we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good that you brought that up because that's absolutely true. Right. And, and yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. They're sweeping under the American and African and Asian carpets all of the the sad <laughs> stories and the <laughs> the crimes and all of that but yeah 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 because i mean they saw the americas as a site of extraction mm. you know this, this was this was another history when you think in the 1600s or so we had hundreds of entities in, in, in Europe and in, in the continent we had hundreds of entities that were sort of little little uh that were little cities of a sort you know that and 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 they sort of work together i mean they had a lot of wars too but, but it, it is a different history from the from the history of colonizing you know of grabbing i mean the thing about the americas is that the americas were seen as sources of all kinds of stuff that could be used it could be used in europe that could be used in other parts of the world that i mean that, that already marks a difference. It became a zone for extracting. In the continent, in Europe, it was different. You know, it, it was same thing with the Chinese. It, it, it's a different story. It's a different history of engagement with the urban condition. And um, yeah. So I think that in one of your projects you 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 tracked or you studied extractive activities on, on yeah on this. yeah I did Extra yeah that was a, that for a while there I was really into extraction. So what did you learn or what what were some of the extraction <laughs> well, activities the that were... that I, some of the stuff that I'm just describing yeah. now you know that a whole variety of modes of extraction it's not just about extracting gold it's much more than that. You know, yes, there was extraction of gold, extraction of this, but it's also the 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 extractions that depended really on destroying others. You know, the indigenous people, whatever. I mean, a whole variety animals. You know, now Europe at some point, early, early, early on, also had that, but the Europe of our sort of modernity is not that kind of a Europe. Uh, 
that, and, and it's the Americas really that reflect this mold. More so, I would say, than also some of the Eastern uh, countries, you know, which also have deeper histories. I mean, Americas was a continent that fell under the controls of those who wanted to extract value. It was not about building. It was not about, you know, a refuge. It, it was, it was a different, its origins, at its origins, it's a different history. That is what I'm saying, because eventually it all sort of, you know, yeah. Yeah, becomes more or less the same. And um, so due to this, let's say, overlasting component of cities into all of that uh so if if we're now due to finance due to the the current economic system more into this extractive uh type of geographies or cities are let's say the the motor or the engine for um leading extraction somewhere on the planet uh perhaps who knows uh we will come to another power system sometime in the future because cities overlast um, power systems so they existed before capitalism they okay. might exist also also after capitalism um, what do you think cities can teach us in this you know perhaps desirable system or more equal uh, okay. or more just power system of the future the best teaching that they can do is what you were describing. In other words, that you have reasonable cities, cities that work. Yes, all cities are going to have injustice in them uh, and they're going to be rich and poor, etc. But many cities, and again, Europe is a very good example. Many of those cities, they work. They work for the people. Sure, there might be nasty elements in play, you know, but then they, they are addressed, etc. And in that sense, I repeat, you know, the Americas, have been more brutal than that European style colonization. Mind you, they were no angels, huh? <laughs> there were no angels in all of this. Uh, so, so um, and I do also think that a well-run city, we haven't quite talked about that, a well-run city in today's world can really make a difference for people who are poor, you know? And it is not about giving them a great house. No, it, it is about maintaining certain basic rules of the game, if you want, in a city. You know, that the cleaners cl come cl and clean the streets, that when the light bulbs go down, even if it's a poor neighborhood, you fix it. You know, that, that all the systems in play, that there is good quality water. Remember in the United States, the famous story of um, when they discovered in Jersey, right? That, that there was water that was, uh, that was venom, that was like venom almost. And these two kids, brothers, one, uh, the older one who had avoided the, the, the bad water uh, and the little one, the differences in their sizes. You know, there was a whole, suddenly we discovered an, an enormous array of little injustices that manifested in our bodies. Little, you know, brothers from the same family, but the one then was there when they had the good water quality and the other was there when they only had the bad quality. You know, the indifference of legislators or whatever the actors in play to sort of make sure that the water is clean, that it's proper this, that it's proper that, right? So, so uh, it's, it's forever a bit of a combat. So the city is not, uh, something that, okay, it's done. It just doesn't work that way. <laughs> you know, there are too many transversal things, too many people who are desperate, etc. you know, all of that. But with it all, so having said all of that, with it all, I say, cities have, they have helped us mostly, you know, they have not been major obstacles. Whereas other issues, have been like the, the 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 quality of water that I was talking about, right? That and that, and when they understood that that was happening, they immediately tried to remedy that. That's another aspect, you know. I mean, 
we confront many issues, no doubt, uh, many more issues that, than, than are usually addressed. Uh, but you have many situations really where they are trying to help. You know, where, where the, what, whatever the, the forces, the people in charge of the city will try to help. And so you, you said a good city or how to run, properly run a city. Um, of course, there is running a city. So having the departments of, uh, of infrastructure, of water, of, of let's say, waste, etc., etc. But there is also, uh, well, all of the ties that we have between each other. And there is also uh, the, the people and then the, the corporate and then the, the other elements. So there is just too many facets to, to hold yeah. into one brain but how do we um but that's why what that is what is amazing to the city and that is why uh we don't have to hold it in our brain to know it because it's an open system and so there are many different sites where it goes a bit differently better here better there but you know there, there is a sense of of something that is accessible to us, the membership, you know, of a city. That's very important. In a very large, beautifully done firm, you know, that all the workers, you know, one of these large, large buildings, you know, for workers, and they all have to have their food at midday, blah, blah, you know, all of that. Okay, very well protected, but you are, you're subject to somebody else, right? Whereas the city, you can be poor, you can be rich, you know, it's also your city. And that I think is very important. Now the privatizing of, you know, areas of cities that is also happening, especially in Latin America, um, that's another story that to me is, is sometimes understandable and in other cases, it's uh, very problematic to have these private, you know, these privatized setups. You know what I'm talking about, right? Do I can't you mean remember what they call or... it in Spanish. What? Do you mean about neighborhoods or? Yeah, I mean, I mean that that more and more, say in Latin America, especially, which is a continent of violence in many ways, uh, that you have um, you have situations where they create it. It looks like a nice, you know, part of the city or housing, mm. but it's actually all protected. You know, like a only closed gate who community. Live there yeah. And can have access to that. I, I don't know how you call that. Closed that, gate community or something like that, yeah. Exactly, gated communities. Yeah. There you go. That to me is is a bit problematic. You know, sometimes it's okay, but in many ways it 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 maximizes the difference between the poor and the rich. And a city shouldn't be that way. A city has quite a bit of that, you know, that it's clear what's rich, what's poor. But at the same time, we are always intersecting. The rich and the poor will intersect in a city, you know, intersect by, by going to the same shop, by, by having to, whatever it is, you know. And, and that to me is important to keep that, to keep that notion that the rich and the poor do intersect in cities. I mean, not as much as I would want to because we have fancy cars, etc. But in smaller cities, you know, where people also walk, you, you have a sense, you know, that the, the poorer and the richer parts intersect in some, they are aware of each other. That's already something. They may not love each other, but they're aware of each other. And that notion of being aware and I, I the modest worker know that I am here and there is somebody who's very rich, but we both are uh, walking on this street. You know, that notion that you, you don't, uh, expel the poorer, you know, they are there. So in the long run, I think that matters. It might not matter in the moment, but in the long run, this notion that the poor will also walk on the streets and in the parks where the rich walk. In the long run, that matters. In the short run, but you don't know. But in the long run, it, it becomes a practice. It becomes part of life. That is what cities have been able to do, that the rich and the poor will regularly confront each other. 
confront not in the sense of but but be next to each other so to speak you know that that kind of thing. Uh, you so you you mentioned it now and i think you you also yourself ha have a history of of activism and cities are let's say the the cradles of uh, of activism well there is of course a lot of activism more and more in places of, of of extraction but how do you let's say we want to act with the city against the city or uh, for the city what's yeah. what are some actions yeah. uh in in face of all of these local and global challenges that we can do within these uh cities let's say that we live yeah well i th i think this is happening people have woken up you know there is something that 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 is active that makes claims that is succeeding and i think the fact that women began to to be this very significant actors in these very partial and very localized moves you know let's make this better let's clean this up because the the women wanted their children to have cleaner you know playing ground whatever a lot of little things and and because most uh, men are supposedly working and so many women are especially when they have small children are still at home you know there was a possibility really for women to set terms into you know in, in the sense that I think we should clean this because this is a good piazza where the children can play whereas that one is is dangerous because the boys can come with the bikes or there are you know, cars that are too close by, whatever, you know, but that you begin to participate, that you, uh, you as a woman, you as a, as a man, you as a child, etc. you begin to participate in, okay, we can do this, we can do that, you know, that energy. And a city that works more or less okay, in which they have multiple sites, you know, it's not all one place, uh, that it really can make a difference. You know, so we have to also give it a chance. We have to give a chance to the locals to understand what can really make a difference because often uh, newcomers to a city, you know, they don't know, well, what's happening here, you know, et cetera, you know. So, so there, there is a kind of, there is a passage if you want that you do when you arrive as a new person into a city and you have to accept that, okay, I don't quite get this and they don't seem to like me, you know, the, there is hard work to do. But at the same time, certain modes of conduct can signal uh, a, a positive disposition, you know, it's a, so it, it's a, it's a, it's a set of uh, informal communication moves, you know, where they don't always require speech. It can be just a signal, you know, just signal that go cross the street with your baby, you know, whatever. And, and that is what a city is good at. And that is what a city should be doing. That the, the, and that means the people in the city, the, 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 the police and, you know, everybody sort of that. You, you make it and you have cities where it all sort of works rather easily. And then you have cities which are a nightmare because there's some ridiculous chief, you know, that is driving everybody crazy. Just end up with two small questions in general. Is do ah, you... yeah, what you call two small questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it should, uh, it should be small. So, um, I, I generally ask, do you uh, have anything that you want to work on for this new year? So a, a project or another element of a city that uh, you want to discover? And lastly, if you have any articles or any books or any movies or something that you would like to recommend to, to continue exploring this topic. Oh, right. On the second part, I will send you some things. That's the simplest is for me to Fantastic. To you. Um, in terms of uh, what was the first one that you asked about a project or something that you would like to still discover uh, in 2022? Well, I think if the, if there is a project that concerns cities and the urban condition, it has to do with me for two things. One of them is that we have to stop just allowing the endless expansion of the cities. That is good for the the prosperous classes and the rich. It's a disaster 
for the poorer classes because they have endless trips to their, I already talked about that. So that to me is a very important point. And whenever I talk about it, they look at me like saying, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, why not? No, it's, it's, a, it's an error. Now there are many places say in Europe where they have the perfect formats, you know, there are a couple that Paris is becoming very, very big, yeah, but, but still, uh, whereas in the Americas, it, it's, it's mixed, you know, it's mixed. Um, so, so I think that there is work to be done in terms of finding, especially in the Americas and, and in some other parts of the world. I think Europe has done quite well in many ways, much better than others. But so there is a real rethinking, how do we enable people? You know, how do we make sure that the quality of water is as it should be? Because water is something that we all need every day, many times in the day, and it can kill if you have the wrong water. And, and we have very sad stories about, uh, say, I think I mentioned to you already the two brothers, one tall, the other very short, uh, because mm, the short one, uh, who was the older one, uh, drank water that was totally contaminated, but it didn't have the taste, you know, you didn't know that it was that way. How is that possible? This happened in, in, a, in a significant uh, city in the United States. It became a famous case, you know, that illustrated and captured a whole variety of those types of elements. So that is one thing. And was there something else that I was going to say or not? You were saying there were two things, so uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the that, straw and, yeah, that, and then I guess the quality. Yeah, so, so one is the, the notion of uh, we shouldn't just allow the cities to grow, grow, grow. We should build new cities. And the other one is we should really pay attention to all the elements that are in play and that affect the health of everybody, old, young, children, etc., the newborn. So, I mean, I think that is something that could be done. I don't see the big deal that it is, you know, I just really don't because it, it, we can do it. You know, it, this is not like building, no, this is cleanup work. Maintenance work indeed. <laughs> Clean and maintenance, right? Yeah, very good. Thank you so much for, for your time, Saskia. Thank you as well, everyone, for listening and watching until the end. Uh, uh, we'll meet you again in a couple of weeks for another discussion. Thanks again, uh, Saskia. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.